It's my pleasure to introduce our third speaker for this morning. Um, and uh, our third speaker is Maitri from the University of Guelph. And, um, and she'll be talking about uh, cluster analysis of Campylobacter isolates. Please help me to welcome Maitri. Good morning and thank you all for being here today. My name is Maithri, as mentioned, and I'm here from the Department of Population Medicine from the University of Guelph. Sorry, got a little trigger happy. Um, today I'll be presenting um, some, some of my results from my thesis work, especially focusing on the cluster analysis of Campylobacter isolates from cattle, swine, and mammalian wildlife that were trapped on southern Ontario farms. Uh, at this time, I'd also like to acknowledge the co-authors um, of this work, Dr. David Pearl, Dr. Eduardo Taboda, Dr. Jane Parmley, and Dr. Claire Jardine, um, which make up the members of my advisory committee, um, as well as collaborators. So briefly, just to start off, um, I'll be giving you a little bit more of an idea of the Campylobacter story, the public health significance of Campylobacter, and why we were interested in studying it in the first place. I'll talk a little bit about the objectives of our study in specific and give you an idea of the methodology that we use to reach those objectives, um, particularly looking at uh, our three lines of methodology, molecular subtyping, regression analysis, and cluster analyses. I'll then discuss the results uh, that came out of this analysis um, on the Campylobacter species prevalence, antibiograms, and molecular subtypes, as well as the C. jejuni cluster analysis that took place. Um, I'll then end off with some of the major takeaways of this research. So Campylobacter jejuni and coli together are the number one bacterial cause for acute gastroenteritis in the developed world, so that does include Canada. They impose a significant burden of disease. Um, usually they can't, the infection is self-limiting, however in severe cases it can cause chronic uh, sequelae such as Guillain-Barre syndrome and reactive arthritis. So because of this, a fair amount of research has gone into understanding how Campylobacter enters um, our food systems and how it can essentially get into human cases. Um, transmission has been documented um, in, uh, environment, from environmental sources, sorry. Um, and because both Campylobacter jejuni and Campylobacter coli are microaerophilic bacterium, meaning they require an oxygen level in their environment lower that, than what is present in our environment. They often associate um, with uh, other organisms, as you can see here, where they're associating with protozoa found in water. If this environmental source uh, is then consumed or com comes in contact with food animals, such as dairy and um, chicken, uh, these essentially these animals can bring that those pathogens into our food systems. So if we consume uh, the food products from these animals undercooked or under unpasteurized, sorry, they can enter human patients. Now what we're interested in studying is how mammalian wildlife play a role in this pattern as well because it hasn't been well established. We want to know whether or not mammalian wildlife play a role in bringing Campylobacter species to our food animals or whether they're directly involved in bringing Campylobacter species to humans. And this research specifically looks at the relationship that may exist between food animals and mammalian wildlife. So transmission between wildlife and agricultural species has been established before. It's not a novel thing. And it's been established with foodborne pathogens. So Salmonella, E. coli 0157, and Campylobacter jejuni as well. So mammalian wildlife is pretty interesting because they have, an inter they have a special capacity to carry and transmit Campylobacter um, to a variety of places. So raccoons in specific harbor a bunch of social behaviors that make them ideal candidates. They have increased contact rates due to the urbanization of their environment. Um, they use a common area of defecation referred to as, lit referred to as latrines. Um, they have large home range sizes. Um, up to three kilometers. So theoretically, they could carry pathogens from their nesting area up to three kilometers away and to every place they come in contact with in between. So what our objectives were in this study were to determine if livestock and mammalian wildlife are sharing the same subtypes of Campylobacter. And if not, if wildlife and livestock species were carrying host-adapted subtypes of Campylobacter jejuni. <coughs> 
So to briefly take you through the methodology, I'll start off with the sampling techniques we used, um, the microbiological techniques, and then end off with our statistical analyses. So our data collection took place uh, on 25 farms that were conveniently sampled in the southern Ontario region. Um, eight of these farms were beef, eight swine, and nine dairy. And both the domestic animals on these farms were sampled, as well as wildlife that were trapped on the same farms. So after the samples were taken, uh, Campylobacter was isolated using standard methods and then sent for molecular subtyping. So Campylobacter specific 40 gene comparative genomic fingerprinting assay, or CGF40, uh, which I will refer to it from now on, is our molecular subtyping technique of choice. It's a highly discriminatory PCR-based method that identifies the presence of 40 genes that are scattered throughout the Campylobacter genome. Um, so it's a very comprehensive method, um, and the output that we get is a one-zero binary output, where one represents the presence of one of these 40 genes and zero the absence. Samples were then, or isolates were then sent for antimicrobial susceptibility testing, and they were tested against nine antimicrobials that are chosen based on their uh, relevance to human medicine. Multi-level logistic regression analysis was conducted, um, and we introduced a random effect for a farm location because presumably we thought, sub, or presumably we thought isolates would cluster based on the farm that they were actually sampled from. We were interested in assessing um, how the prevalence of C. jejuni and Campylobacter species shedding would be influenced uh, by the different sample types in our study, so wildlife or livestock, the different sampled animals, so beef, dairy, swine, raccoon, or other. It should be noted that other represents other wildlife um, due to the small effective sample size of other species of wildlife beyond raccoons. We had to group them together for statistical analysis. We were also interested in seeing if farm type perhaps had an effect on C. jejuni or Campylobacter species shedding. So if wildlife and livestock on a particular farm type showed a different shedding pattern than those on another type of farm. We also looked at antimicrobial resistance and wanted to assess the associations that existed between sample type and exhibited resistance to one or more of the antimicrobials tested, um, as well as with sampled animal and farm type. And um, uniquely, we wanted to see if Campylobacter species also influenced um, the prevalence of antimicrobial resistance. So were C. jejuni more likely to be antimicrobial resistant in this study or C. coli? We then conducted cluster analysis and used standard methods um, in molecular epidemiology. So we used simple matching um, UPGMA to create a dendrogram to, visually, uh, to visualize the clusters of subtypes that were found in this study. We then completed multiple correspondence analysis. So this is a generalization of principal components analysis. And what it does is it generates dimensions to explain the majority of the variance in the data points. And you'll see later on in my results the, um, the outcome of that. And it'll show you essentially the groupings uh, of your data points based on their sample type um, or sample animal. We then conducted exact logistic regression to assess uh, which of the 40 CGF40 genes were significantly associated with being a livestock or wildlife sample. So I'm going to take you through the results of that preliminary Campylobacter species prevalence and antibiogram data now. So to start off with, we had 92 livestock and 107 wildlife samples in total in this study. And as I mentioned before, you can see here that wildlife breaks down into 49 raccoon samples and 58 other wildlife. So other wildlife included things like skunks, uh, mice, and rats. It is interesting to know that squine, or swine sorry, exclusively shed C. coli, um, and C. coli was actually also found in a single rat. So this is actually being followed up with other studies. So our multi-level models, which were accounting for farm location, we found uh, a variety of interesting outcomes. So we found that when looking at Campylobacter species shedding, livestock exhibited a higher odds, a much higher odds significantly, than wildlife in Campylobacter species shedding in general. So this includes C. jejuni and C. coli. When looking at beef and, uh, or when looking at the sampled animal, we found that beef and swine were significantly, had significantly higher odds of shedding Campylobacter when compared to raccoons. So this was in consensus with our previous model. 
In our third model, we found that um, beef were significantly more likely to be shedding Campylobacter jejuni than raccoons, and it is, it should be noted that swine were eliminated from this model because they were only shedding C. coli. And when looking at antimicrobial resistance, we found that livestock um, were much more likely to have isolates exhibiting antimicrobial resistance. And sorry for that little cutoff there, but um, C. jejuni was also much more likely um, to be exhibiting antimicrobial resistance when compared to C. coli. So in order to understand the prevalence differences further, we also wanted to understand if antimicrobial resistance patterns were seen in both of our wildlife and livestock populations. In fact, what we found is that the, the majority of our wildlife samples were susceptible to all antimicrobials, and if they did exhibit any sort of resistance, it was to tetracycline. There was mac macrolide resistance and multi-drug resistance seen in swine that didn't seem to extend into wildlife, which provided more evidence of that lack of crossover or lack of exchange. When looking at our molecular subtyping results that came from CGF40, we identified 50 uh, unique subtypes in our study, um, and of those 50, a subset of those were repeated more than once. Of those that were repeated more than once, there was only a single subtype that was repeated in wildlife and livestock. So this subtype was found on each different farm type, but was only found in a raccoon, a skunk, and two beef cattle. And it should be noted that these were each found on different farm locations. So getting that evidence that subtype crossover was pretty unlikely and very uncommon and only seen in one case, what we wanted to examine was if the subtypes were at least clustering in a way that um, distributed wildlife and livestock together equally, or if they were in clusters that were mutually exclusive. And what we found from our UPGMA dendrogram analysis, you can see here that our wildlife isolates are represented by red lines and livestock by green. And we actually identified a wildlife cluster. So all but two of the wildlife um, isolates in this study were found within this dendrogram cluster. And those two that were actually found with that, that were excluded from this cluster were of subtype seven. So that subtype that was already found in livestock. Um, it is of note that uh, dairy and beef isolates didn't seem to be differentiated into further clusters in, within the livestock cluster, and raccoon and other wildlife also didn't have a further differentiation. Our multiple correspondence analysis um, was completed, and the majority of the variance is explained along dimension one, so I'm going to focus on that. Um, so our multiple correspondence analysis, if you look to the left of this origin over here, you see the majority of our livestock isolates. And the hollow circles here represent dairy, and the solid circles there represent our beef. Um, on the right-hand side of the axis over here, you see the majority of our wildlife isolates, where the hollow triangles represent raccoons, and the solid um, other wildlife. So you see that clear differentiation, and this actually had a high degree of consensus with our dendrogram analysis. So our exact logistic regression, um, we actually found 15 of the 40 CGF40 genes tested to be significantly associated with being a livestock or wildlife sample. So the majority of these genes, the presence of them, were significantly associated with being a livestock sample, um, or positively associated. Um, but the only exception is the three genes that you see highlighted here, which were positively associated with being a wildlife sample. So based on the evidence from our molecular subtyping, um, our antibiograms, and our uh, comparison of prevalence, we found that Campylobacter isolates um, were minimally exchanged between wildlife and livestock um, in southern Ontario farms. And in fact, evidence suggests that there may be distinct clades of C. jejuni in wildlife and livestock populations. So CGF40 may be helpful for source attribution studies in the future to assess whether or not the wildlife are directly um, are a direct source for Campylobacter species to humans. Um, oops, sorry. At this time, I'd like to make my acknowledgments for collaborators of this project. So FAC, um, the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative, the Pathobiology Department and Population Medicine Department at the University of Guelph, the Ontario Veterinary Scholarship, and the Animal Health Strategic Investment Fund.
Thank you very much. Are there questions? Yes. Um, yeah, we actually did assess, but we didn't find a specific subtype um, that was associated with tetracycline resistance, no. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. How many are those EMR resistance genes among these CGF4 genes? How many are EMR resistant? Um, you can see that, actually, I'll show you in that. Not many. Um, but you can see the total frequency of AMR resistance was 40, 42, I think? Yeah. So not many of the subtypes that we found. Other questions? Do you have a hypothesis why the raccoons in the, in the wildlife were not sharing the same between the raccoons and the livestock? Mm. Um, I mean, I my previous hypothesis would be that they were sharing um, because they are mammalian species and with poultry, avian species have been really um, connected to where they're getting um, their Campylobacter from. Uh, I think it might have to do with um, just the preference of the pathogen. So maybe the gastrointestinal systems and um, the maybe size has to do play a part in how the pathogen thrives in each of those, and so different strains prefer wildlife species um, compared to livestock. So it could be interesting, and there has been studies on larger mammalian wildlife, like deer and moose, um, in comparison to things like beef and cattle, because they are of similar size. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>